today is the day that God has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Welcome to worship with First Reformed United Church of Christ in Lexington, North Carolina. No matter who you are, where you are on life's journey, you are welcome in this congregation. My name is Elizabeth Horton, and I serve as one of the ministers of this congregation, and we are grateful that you are here and that we are worshiping together. Even though we have a screen that is separating us right now, we know that we are worshiping a God who is not beholden to any type of screen or limitation. We worship a God whose spirit is free and moving and breaks through all boundaries in this world. And so, as we come together today, we remember that in our sacred times of wonder and in awe, that God is with us. We remember that in our ordinary days of work or rest or play, that God is with us. We remember in this moment that even if we feel as if we are stuck in the muck and the mud of doubt, God is with us, or if we are standing faithfully and assuredly on that shoreline of faith, God is with us there. In the big moments and in the small moments, the God of all creation is with us. And so let us worship. God, our Creator. Amen. I'm reading from Romans chapter 14, verses 1 through 12. Welcome those who are weak in faith, but not for the purpose of quarreling over opinions. 
Some believe in eating anything while the weak eat only vegetables. Those who eat must not despise those who abstain, and those who abstain must not pass judgment on those who eat, for God has welcomed them. Who are you to pass judgment on servants of another? It is before their own Lord that they stand or fall, and they will be upheld for the Lord is able to make them stand. Some judge one day to be better than another, while others judge all days to be alike. Let all be fully convinced in their own minds. Those who observe the day, observe it in honor of the Lord. Also those who eat, eat in honor of the Lord, since they give thanks to God, while those who abstain, abstain in honor of the Lord and give thanks to God. We do not live to ourselves and we do not die to ourselves. If we live, we live to the Lord. And if we die, we die to the Lord. So then, whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. For to this end, Christ died and lived again, so that he might be Lord of both the dead and the living. Why do you pass judgment on your brother or sister? Or you, why do you despise your brother or sister? For we will all stand before the judgment seat of God, for it is written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall give praise to God. So then, each of us will be accountable to God. The Apostle Paul, in his letter to the Romans, reminds the church of how we are to be in relationship with one another. And so in this moment, as we stand before God and one another, we remember all of the times that we have spent bickering, the times that we have spent quarreling or causing divisions. And so let us confess now together the times when we have not shown mercy to one another, forgiven one another. Let us bind our hearts together in our prayer of confession. Loving God, you have lived for us, we have not lived for you. You have forgiven us, we have not forgiven others. You have loved us, we have not loved ourselves, nor have we loved one another. We have been self-righteous, close-minded, and judgmental. Forgive our sins of discord and conceit quarreling and divisiveness. Help us to forgive and to love through Christ our Lord. Amen. Friends, the Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. In this very moment, know that God has heard your confession and your sins are forgiven. Let us forgive one another. Let us forgive ourselves. In Jesus' name, amen. If we were in the church building right now, it would be the time in the service where we pass the peace of Christ one with another. The peace of Christ is what we receive when we are given this assurance of forgiveness that God always forgives us, brings us a great deal of peace. In this day and time, in this moment, we need peace more than ever. And so, even though we are not in the church building, the peace of Christ reminds us that we are not alone. And so, even as we worship virtually, this peace of Christ is not bound to a building, but we see it extended to others all day. May the peace of Christ be with you. Church is more than just a building, more than wood or metal or brick. Church is how we love our neighbor. Church is how we tend to the sick. Feed the hungry and heal the suffering. Welcome strangers and give to the poor. Oh, 
Let us now pray for this world that God so loves. O oh God, your unfailing love has been the source of our strength. It has led us through the troubled waters. It has led us away from our enemies. God, you have heard the cries of your people. You have heard the cries of those who are hurting and are in need. And it is because of your faithful love, it is because of your faith in us and your faithfulness to us that we are able to bring our concerns unto you. We pray in this moment for your church, your kingdom on earth. May your church, no matter where it is on this globe, may it be an instrument of peace, of grace, of mercy. Oh God, in this moment we pray for our global community. We play, pray for the relationships among countries in this world. We pray that we, that we may learn to live together peacefully, that we may learn the, the art of compromise, that we may learn how to cooperate with one another. We pray, O oh God, that we may share in the responsibilities of being good stewards of your earth. We pray now for our community. We pray for Lexington, North Carolina, for Davidson County. We pray, O oh Lord, for all of the concerns that we are facing in this time. And we pray, God, that you will wrap your arms of mercy around those who are hurting, that you will give wisdom to those who are the officials in leadership positions and that you may help us to learn to live peaceably, loving our neighbor. We pray, O oh God, for those who are suffering in this moment, who are suffering in their minds, suffering in their spirits, suffering in mental health, suffering in their body. We pray that you will be at work sending your healing power upon each as they have need. We pray, O oh Lord, that in this moment we give to you the silent concerns, the silent intentions that we keep private upon our heart, knowing that indeed you hear the prayers that are sighs too deep for words. We ask all of this. In the name of the Creator, the Redeemer, and the Sustainer. Amen. This is our time for young disciples, those who are young or perhaps just young at heart. So what I have right here is a pencil, and on this pencil is an eraser. And if you can kind of tell, I don't know if you can, but this eraser has been used. Well, what is the eraser used for? Well, if you said to erase things, you're exactly right. So if we are writing something and we make a mistake, all we do is we take this eraser, we mark it out, and the, the paper is clean and ready to be written on again. As you can tell, I've made several mistakes, and so I've had to use this eraser down almost to the nub. These erasers are kind of like what Jesus is talking about in a few minutes when he mentions about forgiveness, about when we have made a mistake, when we have hurt somebody's feelings, maybe we've said words that weren't kind, maybe we did things that really annoyed them or maybe even made them upset. Well, forgiveness is when that person, after we say, hey, I'm really sorry I did that, that that person says, you know what, I forgive you. And that's just like taking an eraser and erasing the slate clean. There's a fella in the Bible today named Peter. And Peter wants to know, well, how many times do I have to do this? Okay, so somebody has 
made a mistake, somebody has done something against me, and I need to forgive them, but how many times do I need to do this? And so, he says, how about seven? And so my son here is going to count out how many times seven is. One, mm -hmm. two, three, four, five, six, seven. Seven times. Well, as you can see from those M&Ms, seven can add up. That looks like a lot to me. But Jesus says, no, Peter, not seven. Jesus says, I want you to forgive 77 times. Can you imagine using this eraser 77 times? That would take a long time. 77. I wonder how much 77 looks like. Parker will show you. Eight, nine, ten, eleven. Seventy-five, seventy-six, seventy-seven. Seventy-seven times. Wow, that sure is a lot of M&Ms that he counted. Do you think that we can actually forgive somebody seventy-seven times? I don't know. That's a lot of work. That's a lot of M&Ms. But then, you know what else Jesus says? Is that we forgive people 77 times. And the whole reason we do that is because God forgives us 77 times and even more. And so that's a whole different spin on these M&Ms, isn't it? Now we've got this beautiful, delicious pile of M&Ms, 77 M&Ms. That's good news, isn't it, Parker? It's really good news, actually. Okay. I can't eat these by myself, by the way. Well, we'll do it together. <laughs> Let's pray. God, thank you for um, helping us to learn how to forgive, and we thank you that you forgive us. In Jesus' name, amen. We are in a sermon series entitled Building the Church One Rock at a Time. And so we pick up today in the 18th chapter of Matthew, uh, verses 21 through 35. Jesus has just been giving them instructions on what to do when conflict comes up among them, because certainly it will. And so this is directly after he tells them what to do about their conflicts. Then Peter said to Jesus, Lord, how many times should I forgive my brother or my sister who sins against me? Should I forgive as many as seven times? Jesus said, not seven times, but rather as many as 70 times seven. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wants to settle accounts with his servants. When he begins to settle the accounts, they brought to him a servant who owed him 10,000 bags of gold. Because the servant didn't have enough to pay it back, the master ordered that he should be sold along with his wife and his children and everything that he had and that all of those proceeds should be used as payment. But the servant fell down, kneeled before him and said, please be patient with me and I will pay you back. And the master had compassion on that servant, released him and forgave the debt. When that servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him 100 coins. He 
He grabbed him by the throat and said, Pay me back what you owe me. Then his fellow servant fell down and begged him, Be patient with me, and I will pay you back. But he refused. Instead, he threw him into prison until he paid back his debt. When his fellow servants saw what had happened, they were deeply offended and enraged. They came and told their master all about what had happened. His master called first the servant and said, You wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you appealed to me. Shouldn't you also have mercy on your fellow servant, just as I had mercy on you? His master was furious and handed him over to the guard responsible for punishing prisoners until he had paid the whole debt. Then Jesus said to his disciples, My heavenly Father will also do the same to you if you do not forgive your brother or your sister from your heart. May God bless the reading of this holy word. The title of our message is Upon the Rock of Forgiveness. When it comes to reading, maybe reading assignments for homework, does it sound familiar to ask this question, now how many pages do I have to read in order to be done today? Does it matter that there's the chance to read ahead, but how many pages do I have to read to be done today? What is my deadline today? What's the minimum amount? And if I read chapters or pages, which one's less? Sometimes that's what we want to know, isn't it? What is the minimum amount that we have to do in order to meet the standard? What is the minimum amount that we need to do in order to get our duty checked off so that we can go about our day doing other things that bring us joy besides doing homework? Well, Peter, one of the disciples, I think might have been in this frame of mind when he was talking to Jesus on this day in the passage of scripture that we just read. You see the disciples and Peter, they've been traveling with Jesus, learning what life is going to be like once Jesus has departed from this earth. And so right after that, I think that Peter's wheels are turning. And he's heard all of these examples about how we're supposed to do everything that we possibly can in order to keep the community together, in order to stay in right relationship. And so he asks this question. He says, what's the minimum that I have to do, Jesus, in order to meet this qualification? What's the minimum that I have to do in this assignment that you are giving to us? And you see, he is uh, asking, how many times do I have to forgive somebody? How many times? With the disciples, Peter has heard Jesus say many, many times the importance of forgiveness because that is an important part of being in relationship. And so he's asking this logical question, how many times must I forgive before I can write this person off? What is the statute of limitations on sin, on forgiveness? You and I know that Christians can be very mean to one another. You and I know that members of the church can do things to inflict pain and to wound one another. Sometimes knowingly, sometimes not. We know that all who proclaim to follow Jesus can be very ugly at times to one another. Peter knew that too, and he's anticipating. And so he's asking, what must I do? How many times must I forgive Jesus? And then 
almost as if he's on the Matthew's version of The Price is Right. He begins a high-low game. He knows Jesus well enough that it's not going to be just one time. It's not going to be just two times that we're supposed to forgive. Jesus has talked about it much more than that. And so he throws out this number, seven. Is that how many times that we're supposed to forgive one another, Jesus? Well, just like on The Price is Right, Jesus answers and plays along too. But it was not an answer that Peter expected. He thought he was doing really well to up that answer to seven. Jesus comes back and surprises him. No, you are to forgive. Not just seven times. Some Bibles say 77. Some say 70 times seven. You are to forgive. 70 times, seven times, Peter. This is like telling a third grader, <laughs> your homework tonight is to read 490 pages. It feels impossible, doesn't it? It seems impossible. It seems absurd. Jesus is basically saying, there is no limit. There is no statute of limitations, Peter. You are to forgive as many times as it is needed. And so, what do we do with this? That's what I wonder what Peter was thinking. Well, just about that time, Jesus tells a story. That was his custom, that when questions were asked, Jesus would tell a parable. He would tell a story so that then, perhaps, they could understand what God is calling them to do. And so the story is about a king. It is about a king who apparently has many servants. It is about a king who has many people that he employs. One of those servants owed him a lot of money. In fact, he owed him so much money that he would never be able to repay him. Well, the king wants to settle his books. And so as they bring up the ledger, they bring this servant who owed so much money, and they realize that this servant owes something to the equivalent of maybe $2 billion, if we were thinking in our day and age. But for most of us, that's an impossible amount of money to pay back someone. And so this servant owes his master, owes this king, $2 billion. And so the king wants to settle his books. He knows that the servant is not going to be able to pay him back at all because the servant certainly doesn't have that capability of making money. And so the king says, I'm going to cut my losses. We're just going to sell you. We're going to get rid of you and all of your family. And then what we reap from there, I'll just put towards the books, toward your debt, and we'll be done. But I'm going to cut my losses. At that time, the servant comes to the king. And he kneels down before him, and I imagine that he holds out his hands, and he says to him, please be patient with me. I can pay it back. If you listen closely, you might be able to hear that king laughing. He knows that this servant is never going to be able to pay him back. It's just too much money. But here is this servant down on his knees pleading, be patient with me. I will pay it back. And so for reasons that only the king knows, the king decided that he would take pity on this servant and on his absurdly ridiculous request. And so he set the slave free. He canceled the debt and he set the slave free. He and his family would be able to be together. He and his family would not owe this debt any longer. And so, the man, the servant, I imagine in jubilation, stands there filled with gratitude, filled maybe with tears upon his face, isn't that what you see in your mind if you knew that your debt of that much had been canceled? 
Well, in just that moment, another servant comes before this one. I really wish the parable ended right there, but it doesn't. Jesus continues and says, the servant comes before the one who had just been set free of his debts. Instead of reaching out his hands in mercy, that former enslaved man reaches out his hands around the servant's throat and he demands his due as if to choke it right out of his being. The man pleads, have patience with me. I will pay it back. These are the very same words that the former servant had used with his king. The very same words that came out of his mouth. And yet, the man who was shown immeasurable mercy and grace is now the man who shows no mercy at all. He throws the man into the prison. Well, you can imagine that when others saw this, they were outraged. They were deeply offended, as one version says. And so they went. They told the king. The king got word of what happened. And you can imagine how angry this king became. I canceled your impossible debt. And you have the nerve to act this way to the one who only owes you about a month's worth of salary. How dare you? How dare you respond to my generosity by not paying it forward? And so that generosity was rebuked and the man was thrown into the prison. Then Jesus turns this back to the disciples and he says, the story is about you. My heavenly father will do every one of you just like this if you do not forgive your brother or your sister from your heart. In the real world, forgiveness does not come easily, does it? It is hard for us to do. We hold grudges, we become angry, and sometimes we have very much a right to be angry. There are so many injustices that happen in this world, and so we become angry, and yet we will not let go. And so when anger is not dealt with, what does it do? But it infests us. We have trouble forgiving one another's debts. In fact, we are much like those servants. We are given so much grace in this world by God and by others. And yet sometimes we treat one another violently with greed in our hearts and our minds trying to to squeeze blood out of turnips, as the saying goes. Maybe there was something to that 77 amount of times, to that 490 amount of times that we are to forgive one another. Just think about it. If you decided to throw a football 490 times, I almost guarantee that you would be better on that 490th than you would be on the first. The more we practice, the better we get. If you practice the piano for 490 days, well, you know you'll be better at the end than on that very first day. It is muscle memory. And so maybe the point is that Jesus is saying, don't count the chapters, don't count the pages, don't count the times that you are called to called to forgive. Focus on forgiving and then repeating and forgiving and then repeating. And as you do, then your muscle memory will increase and it will become easier and you will be more at peace in your relationships 
will be more at peace. You see, debts, the debts that were freed in this parable, that is the same kind of debt that is spoken about when we pray the Lord's Prayer. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. We pray in this moment that we may have the courage, O oh God, to forgive, to forgive one another as many as 70 times seven. We pray that we may be ones who will cancel out the debts that we believe are owed in this world. And in this moment, we offer you all that we have and all that we are. We do it humbly, even as we pray the prayer that your son Jesus taught. Oh, As you go from wherever it is that you are in this moment know that you are a precious child of the most merciful and the most forgiving God know that you are made in God's image and so by the power of the Holy Spirit go to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with God. Amen.